Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data-Centric Strategy and Roadmap. <laughs> Sponsored today by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. It's the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Now, let me give the floor to Britt Hafner, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce today's speaker and webinar topic. Britt, hello and welcome. Hey, thanks, Shannon. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for finding the time and your busy schedules to join us in today's uh, webinar, Data Centric Strategy and Roadmap. Today we would like to extend a big thank you to our sponsor, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, as well as a big thank you to Shannon and Dataversity for hosting us. We will get started in just a few moments after I let you know about some housekeeping items and introduce your presenter. We have a one-hour presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. We will try to answer as many questions as time allows, but feel free to submit questions as they come up and throughout the session. To answer the top two most commonly asked questions, yes, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials and the webinar recording so you can view it afterwards. Uh, these materials will be sent out within the next two business days. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We've set up the hashtag, uh, hashtag data ed on Twitter so that if you're logging in or logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and submit your questions and comment that way. We will keep an eye on the Twitter feed and we'll include answers to these questions in our post-session email. Now let me introduce you to our presenter, Peter Aiken. Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and eight books. The most recent is Monetizing Data Management. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. He often appears at conferences and is constantly traveling, and today we are fortunate enough to have him in the office here at Data Blue. Always a pleasure, Brett, and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. It's good to be back online after hopefully a nice holiday break. Topic today is strategy, good place to start the new year out. Uh, most of you know that uh, I do an awful lot of these particular strategy talks with my uh, business partner more than 20 years, Lewis Broom, and uh, he couldn't make it today, so it's just going to be me, but I certainly want to acknowledge his very substantive contributions to this particular talk. Today we're going to talk about four parts of looking at a data-centric business strategy. The first one is really understanding the business needs because whatever we do with our data should be focused on supporting the organizational data strategy. If it isn't, one might ask the question, what is the purpose of it? Uh, second is looking at the organizational capabilities in there. Shorthand for this one is a tool in the hands of a fool. Come back to that in about 15 minutes. And then we'll look at round one data imperatives. And this is really key because I call them round one or phase one with the idea of explicitly letting people know that we expect to be doing this on an iterative, ever refining basis. Uh, I have not yet worked with an organization in 30 years that has maintained the same strategy forever. Uh, I'm sure there's some out there, but I haven't, uh, haven't worked for them. Uh, maybe their business models are a little bit easier and they don't need our assistance, right, for it. <laughs> Uh, then finally, we'll finish up at the uh, last quarter of the hour at the uh, implementation roadmap and really talk about the need for a balance in your roadmap because if you err too much on one side, you will be perceived as more of a science project and not really um, implementing something that's useful for the organization. On the other hand, if you deliver too much tactical stuff, you'll never build the capabilities that you need to have in order to get the organization running. We finish up at 3 o'clock with the uh, Q&A, as uh, always. Look forward to speaking with everybody about that. Let's dive in and uh, start talking about understanding business needs. Now, 
I show the overall framework here. This is going to guide us through the entire presentation, and by the end of it, you'll have this thing thoroughly memorized. Uh, first piece of it, as I said, understanding the business needs. And what this really means is that you need to understand the business. And these are the components that go into understanding the business. A lot of people don't think this applies to them, but it, it really is key. Uh, there is a reason that the organization that you're working for exists. It has a mission and a brand statement and some component where it's looking at all of these things in order to try and make its existence there for the shareholders, for the management, whatever it is that we're working at. Then we want to ask, in order to exist, it exists to do something, and we want to know what products or services the company produces and sells. Again, this leads to market positioning and competitive advantage that are in there. And then how the company does it. How are they going to deliver? Uh, one of the funny things that we've done over the years is uh, chuckled because Amazon has gone full circle on this one. Uh, the company originally was doing this because it had no bricks and mortar. And uh, in fact, both Britt and I live close enough that we can get the two-hour delivery directly uh, from Amazon in there. So how the company does it, they're back in the bricks and mortar business uh, on all this. What this does is it gets us to what we're really trying to find out. What does the business need in order to run? And data is going to be a component of it increasingly in particular. Now, it's important also to understand a little bit about business uh, strategy in this. And we reference Michael Porter in this. Uh, Porter's done a lot of work in that area. If you Google him, you'll see a lot of things that are on there. But the, the idea on this matrix here is that you really can't be all things to all people. So this is a great way of doing this. If you're not familiar with this as you're uh, familiar with your data management environment, you might want to wander down. There's probably a group called strategy, or certainly the C-levels will be uh, able to answer these kinds of questions. For example, is, is your um, product in particular here looking at the ability to sell low cost, or is it differentiation? Uh, there are different companies that fit into these, and I'll throw a couple of uh, examples at you in just a minute. And does it do this for a broad range of buyers or a narrow range of buyers? So how specifically focused are your product? Are you selling rubber bands and paper clips? Uh, that's one thing. Or are you selling something that people can't get other places? Uh, cost, are you competing on cost? Clearly Apple, for example, with their focus on premier brands is not focusing in on cost. They try to keep the cost the same every year so that you don't feel bad working over 600 bucks a year for your new latest and greatest um, iPhones on that. And again, all this speaks to market scope. So when we move now into this. Let's look at a couple of examples. And of course, Walmart is going to fall into this category. All of you listening to this call know what Walmart's business strategy is. It's four simple words, everyday low price. The fact that you know their strategy and they know your strategy, everybody is okay with that. They'd much rather you know their strategy because it actually talks about the way they do it and how they deliver their business. So Walmart's going to be a category of broad range of buyers, but a lower cost. When we look down at Dollar General, they're also lower cost, but they're focusing on a narrower buyer segment, people that are looking for specifically dollar types of items in there. Uh, again, trying to chip away at perhaps a portion of Walmart's business that's there. When we look at differentiation, Whole Foods would love everybody to shop there. Uh, Lewis actually jokes and calls them whole paycheck on a regular basis. Uh, but they certainly are going to be looking at a broad differentiation. And uh, again, a specialty cheese shop like Murray's Cheese in New York City, focusing in on a narrow buyer segment of people who just go shopping for cheese. Personally, I've never done that, but I always like the cheese uh, that goes into there. So then we throw another category of Trader Joe's. You can sort of straddle the middle if you try and do it really, really well. But what this gets us back to is one of the favorite questions, and this is one of our favorite TED Talks. I've given you a reference to it in the lower left-hand corner there. A fellow named Simon Sinek, he's made an industry out of doing this, and his message is very simple. Everybody tends to be very good at describing what it is they do. That's really good because we tend to do it, so we tend to be able to talk about it. But when we talk about how we do it, we don't end up being quite as good at it, and it doesn't tend to be the first thing that we think about. People tend to be more concrete and focused on it, so they focus on the what. 
how. Of course, what Simon wants us to focus on is the why, and that tends to be the area that people are least expressive about, least able to talk about in a regular ongoing session. So the message from this is to really focus on the why first, and the other two parts will come later. Most organizations absolutely overly complicate their strategy. It ends up being things where people say, oh, you need an MBA in order to understand this. But what it really amounts to is that strategy that winds up on a bookshelf is absolutely not useful. And you've got to be able to have strategy that everybody can understand. Again, focusing back on Walmart, you all know Walmart strategy, every day low cost. That is a terrific way to do it. Everybody understands what it is they're doing, and they don't need a three-ring binder or a bunch of consultants to explain it to everybody. Now, strategy as a concept has actually only entered our vernacular around the beginning of the 1950s. Before that, it was largely a military-focused concept of how we're going to beat the bad guys uh, in a military action, but we've now come to accept that it has a lot of good business applicability as well. Uh, my favorite definition is Mintzberg's a pattern in a stream of decisions. And I'll give you an example of that right at the moment. Uh, when you're facing competition that is bigger than you, what is one of the strategies that you can use to employ in that? And the answer is divide and conquer. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a sort of video thing here just to explain that, mainly because everybody understands how simple it is. Uh, the two larger armies, the red and the black, were facing Napoleon, and one of the things Napoleon understood, even though he was facing a larger army, was that when you hit an army, it tends to retreat across its supply lines. So the supply lines are shown here in the red and black dots. And his plan was very, very simple. If I hit them right in between the two of them, which means I have to have good intel on where each of the red and the black forces are, they will tend to retreat in two separate directions along the lines of their supplies. I can then beat up one and then turn around and beat up the other. That simple strategy won him the day there, and having troops that understood that strategy obviously was key to it. You can imagine in the heat of battle, you don't have a lot of time to do very complicated planning, so a simple strategy worked really well there. Another example of this is Wayne Gretzky, the soccer great, also has a very simple strategy. He skated to where he thought the puck would be. If you're following the puck around on the ice, the puck goes very, very quickly, and it becomes very, very difficult in order to catch up with it, much less get in front of it or be in a position where one can score. So the essence of an organizational data strategy is that it should be absolutely simple. I say 10 pages max, one page is wonderful. Uh, the key is, again, you're looking for an easy explanation. Remember, outside of data, most people do not understand or appreciate how it is to do this. So you've got to have something that you can put in place with an elevator pitch. Uh, again, I'll put a couple of Porter quotes up here. The essence of strategy, for example, is choosing what not to do. One of the things that I've looked at several organizations uh, is that they're trying to do too much at once, and it's simply not possible to do all of the things simultaneously, uh, but uh, doing one thing well is good, which means strategy often is not just trying to do just the one thing well and not able to do all the others simultaneously. Similarly, strategy at a very high level is should be able to be implemented then, if it's simple enough, across a multitude of IT projects. Uh, I did some work for one organization at one point where they told me at any point in time they had hundreds and hundreds of IT projects going on. I said that was terrific, or were they sure that all 100 of those projects were able to be, in fact, focused on organizational strategy at the time, and they kind of went, hmm, okay, that's an interesting question, I'm not sure. Of course, the, the real question is if you're not focusing on strategy, what are you doing? Uh, so again, a high level of abstraction that you're able to do this, and really, if it doesn't support the organizational strategy where people look at it and say, oh yeah, I got that, uh, then it's going to be very, very problematic. So another Porter quote here, the essence of strategy is choosing to perform activities differently than rivals tend to do. And you've got to be able to explain it, why data is helping your organization create a competitive advantage. Maybe it's adding value to products and services. Maybe it's enhancing the customer experience. 
We hear the word transparency a lot. Certainly government organizations want to do transparency. Data is all about transparency. If you don't have the data, you have no transparency. High quality data enables organizations to do more with less and can help us creatively disrupt, excuse me, disrupt how we end up doing work on this. And finally, everybody gets that data is increasing, uh, the Internet of Things, all sorts of uh, uh, competitive things are out there to help increase the flow of data all around this. And I'm going to give you a little bit of consulting advice here. You can sit in any meeting that you want and say the following and you will look really, really smart. There will never be less data than right now. So let's move now from our understanding the business needs to getting the current state of organizational maturity and why data strategy has been kind of hard. Now, I'm back to our framework. We've talked about business needs, and out of business needs, everybody says, okay, great, then what I should do next is come up with a solution. And I'm sorry to tell you that that is absolutely wrong. Uh, most organizations try this and they fail absolutely miserably. What we'd really like to do is to look specifically at the current state of readiness, not just your data management group, not just the IT group, but the organization as a whole. Because if we don't understand what the organization is capable of, we have no ability to hand it the right set of tools, techniques, people, process, and technology. So I put a big X there to make sure we just got a placeholder and we'll come back uh, and look at this in just a second. Uh, one of my favorite sayings these days is a good technology in the hands of an inexperienced user rarely produces positive results. I had somewhat many cases like handing a key to a Tesla, and I don't know how many of you have had a chance to ride in a Tesla, much less drive one, but they're phenomenal pieces of engineering. But they can end up with some very poor results. As a result of that as well, that is actually a Tesla stuck between two buildings. Have no idea what the story was there, but ouch. And I, I say that because in many cases, organizations go out and purchase technologies. Uh, this is a piece from uh, my good friend's uh, website on this, uh, Mr. Ferguson here, and it's a great explanation of how to build an integrated master data management system uh, on this. The challenge, however, by focusing only on the technology is that most people are not really aware that master data management rarely succeeds by itself. In our experience, we've found most often that you need to add at least two other components. In the case of master data management, you really need also to have good data governance and good quality data in order to make it succeed. Because if you don't have these other two components in place to do the kinds of things that you need to have, the MDM technology works absolutely terrifically. However, if people don't understand that you can't just use the MDM as another place to store data, and I've heard this many, many times when I'm working for organizations and they will say, where are you gonna stick that data? Well, I, I didn't know where else to stick it, so I stuck it in the MDM. No, that's not what we want to do. And of course, the other part of it is that we understand from an architectural perspective, master data should be higher quality data than your typical organizational data, and governance is the only way, in fact, you're going to do that. Uh, again, these interdependencies are largely unknown, so governance makes the case for and is responsible for implementing data quality, which is a necessary but insufficient prerequisite to success, again, of the master data initiative and the MDM capabilities help to constrain the governance effectiveness around that process. Again, not knowing these pieces here, what we're trying to do is to say to the organization, you shouldn't buy expensive, complex technology unless you have the stomach for learning how to do it. Uh, again, crawl, walk, and run is the way it's usually articulated in that process. Similarly, from an understanding the organizational capability perspective, most people don't realize there's an absolute correlation between Maslow's hierarchy of needs and organizational data management capabilities. Most people remember Maslow from high school. It's the idea that in an oversimplified session, if you have food, clothing, and shelter needs, at the bottom of that pyramid of needs, you're never going to get to self-actualization. Each 
of these levels needs to be present and solid before you can move to the next level. So getting to self-actualization, one has to have esteem. If one doesn't have esteem, one will never get to self-actualization. Uh, a piece we use in technology in, in today's environment, we call it slow. Uh, we we'll understand it in exactly the same way. Our data management practices are similar. Everybody's focused on the top half of this golden pyramid that I like to call uh, the golden pyramid of data management practices, and they are a technology-based focus. But that is, of course, just the tip of the iceberg. And if we don't understand the foundational practices that have to go along with it, which really are organizational capabilities, we can do these other things, but they are problematic. In fact, it's also important to understand the linking, the arrangement, the architecture that these practices have. And what I'm showing you in this example here is that governance, strategy, quality, and operations are strong practices, but the data platform and architecture in this instance is considered weak. Now, we at Data Blueprint get questions all the time, and people will say to me, well, Peter, I understand you, you we need to do these foundational pieces, but my boss says it's got to be done by Friday. The problem is, without these foundational practices, everything takes longer, costs more, delivers less, and presents greater risk to the organization than if instead you crawl, walk, and run your way up to the top of that pyramid. So, Lurley, it's important to understand the DMM structure of these integrated practice areas. So these five that I'm showing here, governance, data management strategy, data quality, data operations, platform, and architecture are all the same that were in the basement of the basement, the foundation of that pyramid on the previous page uh, that's here. And what it means is from a data strategy perspective, we're going to manage data coherently as opposed to at the work group level, try to elevate that practice up to the organizational level. If there is a professional category now of data managers, we call them data governance professionals uh, in this process. And that data needs to be maintained so it is fit for purpose. It's effective and efficient. We're never going to get to 100% correct data, so let's not try for it, but let's find out what works and what is useful in that process. Uh, platform architecture implementation, data operations, and understanding the right life cycle are all critical pieces in order to do this. And of course, you need some level of organizational support. Now, I'm just giving you in one minute here the subject of one of the uh, webinars we're going to come up with. Melanie Mecca and I are going to do this one in May where we'll spend an entire day on uh, this topic working into it. But the bottom line from a strategy perspective and from understanding organizational perspectives is that these five areas are linked by a weak chain method, which means that each able, each ca um, excuse me, each area is able to be rated from a maturity perspective. And if we understand that the weakest link nature of the reporting is key to this, so that this entire foundation is only as strong as the weakest link in this foundation, this gives us a very good set of targets to do. Now, the, the scoring on this is kind of harsh. Uh, it's kind of like getting a D in high school and being called a D student for the rest of your life. Uh, and here we're looking at a sub-area of data governance, for example, and we're seeing that this one area means that their entire data governance practice can only be as strong as the weakest area that's in there. This ability to granularize these pieces gives us improved guidance on each of the processes. And our scheme for rating them is actually very, very scientific, uh, with the exception of CMM and ITEL uh, in this case. Process improvement frameworks, RUP, COBIT, PMI actually show a decrease in on-budget and on-time project performance. And of course, CMM, CMMI gives us the best improvements on budget and on time in order to do this. Now, what this means is that we're going to rate each of those areas in our organization from a one, you have a pulse, to two, somehow our processes are managed, are repeatable. Three, they're actually defined, which means we can start employing standardization to them. Four, we measure them, because if we don't define them, we can never standardize them and then never measure them. Again, measuring them gives us the ability to say more or less. And finally, if we look at them over time, we can say, are they, in fact, able to be optimized? Should we do a little more of this, a little less of that? This process of looking across things is the basis for TQM 
ISO 9000, many other process improvement frameworks. Again, I showed you on the previous slide. This is the best way to do this. It's also the simplest, and most importantly, your management already understands it. So when we take these two pieces from each side of the equation, the assessment components, which are those five areas that I told you about before, and rate them on that one to five scale for the CMM scale, we can now do things like look and see how the organization is. Now, some of you may be from the insurance industry. This is an analysis we did a couple of years ago for the insurance industry. And you can see here the average insurance company that was included in the survey did not have repeatable data management practices. That's horrific, and it's not the way it should be. Uh, similarly, we can look across organizations and come up with little specific pieces and say, well, here's one, for example, that I did for an airline. And when I was working with this airline, I showed them that they were one, one, two, twos, and a one. And they kind of went, what's that? And I said, well, it's maybe not important if you don't care, but here's your competition. And they all went, oh, okay, we're the ones and they're the twos. That's bad. Hate to make it so simplistic, but sometimes you need to have that sort of a process. The white lines on here, by the way, are the overall respondents, so showing them how them they compared at the time to uh, everybody else that was in there. Uh, what this says is clearly this organization should not be putting more time and effort into making the twos into threes. They need to put more effort into bringing the ones up to each of the twos. Uh, this also is a bit that can be helpful internally because uh, you'll notice I didn't tell you which airline or which insurance companies that are on here, but the uh, World Bank Group told us we could use these numbers uh, as they were going through it. And they had done an internal survey where they compared their treasury group, their information systems group, and their business group on their practices. Uh, this was specific to the data governance area, but clearly what you saw here is that at the time, their governance practices were absolutely world class. And so it wasn't necessary for them to go out and hire external consultants in order to find out how to do the things they wanted to improve. They just had to walk down the hall and work with their colleagues uh, in order to come up with this. So this assessment process gives you the ability to understand what's happening in your organization and whether you're capable of using these pretty advanced technologies that come in which is where we see most of the mismatches that are on there. The other thing I put up here are the industry benchmarks and the overall benchmarks, but uh, we won't look at that. But when we look at overall organizations, what you're seeing here is, again, that in this era of big data, which I call 2007 to 2012, uh, most organizations didn't improve their practices, and that's really a problem when you consider the amount of volume that is increasing for all of their data. Now. One of the other reasons that it's real important to do this is because data strategy does not tend to exist well at a lower level of the organization. It's like the game of telephone, where somebody says a phrase in one ear, and as they go through and pass it all the way around, they eventually come up with something on the other side. So the kid at the end of this particular telephone said, it's a pie tray. And no, no, the answer was it was 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. By the way, if you have a chance to do this at your own meetings, it's actually quite an effective exercise. Just take 10 people sitting around a table and have them pass a phrase around like that and see if the phrase goes from one place to another correctly. The problem with strategy, and particularly difficult strategy, is that most organizations have large and complex IT operations. And so if there is a coherent strategy or a single set of organizational goals and objectives, it's communicated to the division at IT, but you have the same game of telephone that occurs, which means at the project level, at the IT project level, strategy is not well perceived. And what does get down there is often confused, inaccurate, and incomplete, resulting in IT companies that do not well understand organizational strategy. I'll give you a very specific example from one of the groups that we've worked with. It's a logistics company, Fortune 450 company that had four divisions. Uh, you can see them up here, and they'd experienced significant growth over the past decade. And they were going on an enterprise-wide modernization program. They understood that they needed to do more with their data. They had a revenue goal uh, growth of achieving $10 billion in revenue by the year 2020. And as we were working with them, we started to go through this exercise, and we said, so what are your brand promises? What are the things that you do? And interestingly enough, they were kind of going, well, I don't know, I guess we have to find somebody that can tell us this. Uh, now, as you imagine, we fly around a lot, and we were at the airport, and a, on the carousel, advertiser came up 
unmatched capacity, unrivaled service, undeniable flexibility, undisputed experts, and unprecedented control. And we took these back and said, hey, what do you think about these? And the IT person we were working with on the other side was writing them down and saying, gosh, these are great. Can I take them over to marketing and see if they like them? And of course, the absurdity of it was these were what marketing had put up there, but they didn't even know their own strategy. Now, if you look at them in this case as a strategic and strategic perspective, they had four different businesses. Brokerage services were low cost, broad range of buyers. Intermodal was a little bit more uh, expensive. Outsource services gave them a differentiation play and the truckload brokering capability gave them uh, a lot of differentiation. What they needed to do was act as a single company because what would happen is that somebody would call them up and say, can you move something from place A to place B? And they'd say, well, no, we're at capacity today. And they'd say, but I'm looking out on the lot and seeing some trucks that are sitting there. Uh, it's just an awful sort of a situation. They didn't have visibility, so they needed to go back in and change the buyer power that was currently moderate to weak and set these other variables up so that they could look at this. Now, I've given you a fair amount here in this current state inventory of the data management practices and understanding this. We also need to get a set on sense of what the data assets are. That's an inventory problem. The businesses, are they good at understanding business process architecture or not? Uh, what sort of technologies do they have currently in their organization? And finally, we need to understand organizational readiness. And we found that organizational readiness is actually one of the biggest challenges. And we've used this chart. Uh, absolutely want to give credit to uh, Mary Libet. It's an adaption of her managing complex change model. But uh, the idea here is, of course, if you have confusion, you probably have a great action plan, wonderful resources, great incentives and skills, but you're missing the vision. So you've got the vision, incentive, resources, and action plan, you've probably got anxiety because somebody doesn't have the right sets of skills. Uh, we've used this template dozens and dozens of times to help diagnose what's wrong with your organization. And believe me, when you do the same thing with your organization in terms of trying to discern organizational readiness, you may have an idea that, again, just to pick on the MDM thing, uh, from Mike Ferguson, it fits right there in the vision thing. You can do the incentives, the resources, and the action plan, but if you haven't got the skills to know how to implement that, you're probably seeing anxiety in the organization. And people will look at this and really kind of get that. Uh, there's a saying that Peter Drucker made years ago, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the idea is, of course, that culture can be the biggest impediment in most cases to understanding what's going on you can have everything working really, really well, but if the culture ain't ready for it, it's probably not going to work well at all. So that's what we mean by data strategy is kind of hard, understanding that current state of organizational maturity and whether you're, in fact, ready to take off on this wild adventure with your Tesla or whatever it is you're going to get to. So let's move now to data imperatives. And again, I stress the key to this. So remember, we've already done this business needs. We come down here for the solution. No, that's not right. Only when we understand the business needs and understand the current state of the organization does it make sense to then start to work with business imperatives. And these business imperatives are the things that you need in order to satisfy the business needs. Now, many people like to try and figure out how to sell this. And I like to do sort of a, a series of thought-provoking questions. This is an old joke, but the CFO says, what if we train our people and they leave? And HR comes back and says, what if we don't train them and they stay? Ooh, that's an interesting conundrum. People like that. They actually do this. This is an old joke. I put the credit for it up there. A strategic thinker says, well, what if we can just train the top people to leave? <laughs> and frankly, I've been to a number of organizations where that might be a better idea. Uh, so question people come up with is, why do I need a data strategy? And the answer is because you want to manage your data with some guidance. Because if you're not managing the data with guidance, what are you doing? These data strategy components, these delivery pieces, the organizational needs, should be sequenced. And I'm going to give you just a, a macro perspective on it here, but it's important to understand at least this. Uh, so. Again, we could look at a dichotomy here that Porter put to us for improving operations or doing innovation. 
And most organizations don't have a formalized data strategy at all, but if they do have a formal data strategy, it may be focused on the right, wrong kinds of things. Uh, for example, here, uh, Walmart is well known for being expert at increasing operational efficiencies and effectiveness. They are terrific. You've heard stories about them. Uh, again, uh, they are just an absolutely phenomenal group at learning how to do things because everybody in that company understands every day low cost. And that's a really good thing from both an employee perspective but also from a consumer perspective. A company like Apple, however, uses data to create strategic opportunities. And they look at this and they go, oh my goodness, uh, you know, what can we use data for? And what they, they did is they said we need to get into the music streaming business because the uh, download business is going away, same way that the vinyl business went away, the CD business went away, the laser disc business never really got there in the first place. Uh, but anyway, we come up with this idea here and then say, okay, we're going to use data to create strategic opportunities. The question is, are the people in version three of that strategy going to be good at increasing organizational efficiency and effectiveness? And the answer is that's a very different type of person, a very different type of thinking, very different type of data science, if you will, if you want to think of it that way, and take the converse. Increasing the organizational efficiency and effectiveness is also not necessarily the kind of thinking that you need to have to do innovation. So there's a, a pathway that makes sense. Go from without your strategy, use the increasing efficiencies and effectiveness in V2, and use that money to invest in creating opportunities to get you up to V3. And of course, V4 means that you're getting good at both V3 and V2. I would estimate I've met a handful of companies over the year, uh, years that uh, can actually do this at any way at all. <clears throat> Again, only one in 10 organizations actually has a board-approved data strategy, so that becomes really problematic. Now, let me give you a quote here, and this is a, a quote from Bill Gates, but this is the quote most everybody sees, and the problem is it's almost always taken out of context. So let's look at the context here. Application design and businesses are now irrevocably linked. Virtually everything in business today is an undifferentiated commodity except how a company manages its information. How you manage the information determines whether you win or lose. How you use information may be the one factor that determines its runway success or failure from a business model perspective. What this means is we have to get people to understand the same things that we do here at Data Blueprint, which is that data is our most powerful underutilized and poorly managed organizational asset. It is the only non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset that is possessed by any organization. And as an asset, people understand that they need to treat it better. So we see this on the boards an awful lot of the time where people say data is the new oil. Well, the problem is we don't think about oil after we use it. And so it's really the wrong model for it. A better model is data is the new soil. Uh, plant stuff in it and good things will grow. That's great. We actually saw this. Uh, it's a T-shirt we're thinking about making. I don't know if Britt will get into this or not. Data is the new bacon. Well, that probably is not great, but whatever you need to do to sell it is, is really great because if we can help to unlock data management value here, this helps organizations strengthen their capabilities, provide solutions that are going to work for the place that the organization is at at that point in time, and reestablish the partnerships that we've long lost between IT, the business, and in this case, the data groups that are there. Now, Gartner's done a real interesting uh, survey here just last year. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, what they did is they said, how are CEOs, notice not CIOs, but CEOs recognizing data as an asset? And we're actually seeing a lot of work in this area. So 33% of the CEOs say they measure the benefits of each type of information asset. 24% uh, said they quantify the value of this. I'll show you an example of that in just a bit. 22% of them said our information assets are well cataloged. Uh, none of these are good, by the way. 11% said they don't regard information as a kind of an asset. That may be true for about 10% of the companies. Okay, we'll let them have that. And 10% said they're directly monetizing assets by bartering or selling them outright. Uh, put in a quick little plug there for my book on monetizing data management, which can help you all to start figuring that out. Now, I'll tell a little quick story here of Data Blueprint. One of the things that we get a lot of times 
is that people come to us and say, can you develop a data strategy for us? And we said we'd be glad to help you out with that. Organizational strategy is a wonderful thing we need to look at. And, and they go, okay, great. And we also could use the IT strategy that goes into there as well. There's a problem with this, though, thinking in traditional fashion. And that is that if we look at IT project-specific or application-centric development, what it means is that organizations start out with strategy and then they think they should go and implement IT projects. That's a, a pretty reasonable way of, of thinking about it. But what that means is that the data is only considered within the scope of the IT project, which means that the data is formed around the applications and not around the organization-wide requirements or around the shared requirements. It means that the processes are narrowly formed around the apps and very little data reuse is possible. The reason for this is because we've taught people wrong for all of these years. IT projects follow a waterfall or an agile model in order to create this, and they create more data silos. They say we can develop the software and we can develop the data within the confines of a project. The problem is that evolving data is different than creating systems. Again, if we consider data as our sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset, this means that we have to understand that data systems evolve as opposed to making them create. And that there has to be a natural sequencing here where data evolution is separated from external to and precedes these system development life cycles. So one of your first goals as a data strategy is to come in and take a look at your data strategy and say, how are we using data in the organization and make the fundamental changes that you need to have in order to do this. I've been trying to articulate this concept for a while, and I apologize, this is about the best I've been able to do, but we've got some shared data out there at the top in the upper left-hand corner in the gray, and we have an individual IT project. They may ask for some metadata assets or some reusable data as part of an individual IT project, and those results go back into the individual IT project. And at the end of the implementation, we should extend the original shared data to include the new data that was developed as part of that IT project. So it's our metadata layer, our data architecture layer at the very top uh, that's there. And the second IT project that comes along to do this, again, may get some data from it, may use the data, hopefully we'll share its data back with the rest of the organization, uh, the metadata catalog, the architecture that's up there, and it's increasingly important because over time, the number of requests increase, the utility of the results increase, and most importantly, the contribution that data is making to this process increases as well. But what this really means is that when we look at data development, we really need to think about it in a completely different fashion. Fundamentally, in support of strategy, we should be developing database goals and objectives, but that these goals and objectives should not drive the IT projects, but that they should uh, drive the information products. And the information products then drive the IT projects. Because this way we can develop these data assets from an organization-wide perspective and also make sure that we accompany the system perspectives. And finally, the last part, maximize our data reuse. So this process here of organizational strategy, IT strategy, and data strategy is all wrong. And what it should be is something like this. The data strategy should come directly off of the organizational strategy and be developed in conjunction with the IT strategy. However, we would like the data strategy to have more of an influence on the IT strategy than the IT strategy has on the data strategy. After all, you show me your data IT assets that are your sole non-depleting, non-degrading, durable strategic assets, and uh, I'd like to see them because they don't exist. Now, the other part of this, too, saying round one, is important to make them understand that there will be a round two, uh, and that is absolutely critical to make sure that they understand that this change in the way you do things then allows the organization to start unlocking the value of its data as it goes forward. Let's get into our last section here then, implementing data strategy roadmap on this. Again, we've gotten to here, business needs, current state, now gives us combined our ability to create strategic data imperatives. And now through execution of those imperatives, we come up with a roadmap. However, the roadmap is a really, really key part of this because it's your articulation of what's going to be happening. And it's got to be a balanced approach. If you deliver no business value, 
on the left-hand side of the diagram there, you will not be able to sustain your effort. On the other hand, if you focus all of your efforts on infrastructure capabilities, you will similarly not be able to uh, derive the business value that you need to have it. It's very much of an art. It has to be done as a compilation and a balancing act between business value delivered and new capabilities delivered to the organization. If you go too much on one way or too much on the other way, you will have zero bits of success in implementing your data strategy. Let's dive in and take a look at a couple of quick examples. It's a query that we found running in one organization, and this query might look actually kind of complicated. However, when you consider the fact that it actually ran literally hundreds of thousands of times a day, it makes a difference on whether it should be, in fact, optimized or not. So when the query came back optimized, you can see it was a lot simpler uh, in order to do this. Now, the problem is when you repeat bad data practices thousands, uh, we've even seen millions of times a day, it means that your organization is suffering from what we call death by a thousand cuts. And I'll give you a very specific example on this. It's one of our customers we've worked with over the years. It's a multi-billion dollar chemical company. Uh, it's kind of fun because we went in the other room one day and told the guys that were in the other room that they needed to wear lab coats for this environment. They're thinking, oh, cool, healthcare. We said, nope, engine oil. They went, what? Now this company goes in and it develops additives for engine performance. And what they're trying to do is help the fuels burn cleaner, the engines run smoother, and the machines last longer. And when they need to do this, they take it downstairs and they run these tests. And they run literally tens of thousands of tests annually. When you consider that the tests cost up to a quarter of a million dollars a piece, and they're keeping no metadata on those tests, you can see there's an upside potential there for this group. Now, let me explain the, the research group here. These are a group of about 100 PhDs in chemical engineering. Very smart individuals. Uh, again, each of them, we're just gonna put a price tag on it of $100,000 a year. You know those are not correct examples, but it's roughly a $10 million a year investment in this particular piece. And the question is, how many tests can they perform each year? Can they increase the customer satisfaction with the products? And can they come up with improved productivity themselves as they're trying to do better things into this? Now, I have to tell you, we actually got to this stage here, which was mapping out their process, and the organization said, whoa, stop, you're done. And we went, no, no, we haven't delivered any business value yet. And they said, yeah, but we never knew what it was that they did in the first place. What you're seeing here is a lot of activities that are designed to get data into something called SAS. It's their version of analytics that were there. What we did this for, of course, was to try and look, though, at what they were doing. And the idea was, I've circled it in red there, they had a PhD in chemistry who had some thing called an exploded formulation that would take it from one computing system and turn around and digitally type it into another digital computing system. I guarantee you anybody that's listening in on this webinar today could find a better way of doing that particular process. The second thing that we found that was problematic was that they were using manual file manipulation, moving things around by hand using USBs and in some cases even floppy drives uh, in order to do this. This means the data can only exist in one place and is dependent on schedules in order to increase the productivity of the group. Third component of this is the ability to duplicate or manipulate the data. So you can see I've circled three things in red where we found there were places where we had tribal knowledge set up so that people just had to know that they had to either cut and paste certain things over here in order to get it from this cell into this cell. Of course, cutting and pasting by hand could be problematic, but if nothing else, it could represent the possibility of introducing errors into the process. Then we also had some synonym reconciliation that we had to resolve. Uh, the idea here was that people were, again, doing their work, doing a pretty good job on it, but coming up with little problems that they weren't able to resolve because they didn't understand um, the ability of everybody else to speak the same language. Now, that gives us, sorry, gives us the ability to set that and fix it and standardize on one particular language. And finally, we had another set of tribal knowledge requirements where you had to know where people were going to be setting up 
were doing different things at different parts. Again, it may be that somebody knew this came from the UK and they had to transfer the units from uh, English to metric units, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in order to do that. And finally, does anybody know what that technology is? Right, the idea is that set of databases were never even made Y2K compliant. So we have a lot of organizations that are out there. And again, these guys were Y2K compliant, but they were chemical engineers. They didn't know what Y2K was. They didn't have any concept as far as how things were going to play out in that process. So they didn't know that they didn't know that they were using technology that should have been retired years ago. Now, I bring all this up because this made an excellent example of something on their data quality roadmap. We helped improve their business practices. We helped them do all kinds of uh, architectural improvements, quality things, integrated some of their systems together, which meant we could reduce the number of tests that they had, increase the number of tests they were able to accomplish per researcher, and reduce the time to market for new products. And finally, at the very bottom of that, of course, the question is, what was the business value to the organization? And the answer was, their $10 million group saw a $25 million gain in productivity each year, thanks to these additional improvements that we had. Now, doing that is good. You've also got to make sure that people understand that. Now, this is a balance. I said, in that sense, this is one way of delivering very concrete pieces. If you concentrate on doing just that type of solution, what you'll end up with is, in fact, lots of those little solutions. But you haven't made anybody better. And this is what you need to concentrate on the other side of the equation, getting better within your organization on practicing how to be good at data management. I often ask audiences, what is the world's oldest profession? And the answer, of course, is accounting. Uh, if we look back at data management, we actually have about 100 years of focused activity in that area, so that only in 2009 did the data management body of knowledge get produced uh, by data excuse me, DEMA International. Uh, I was president at the time. We were very happy to get the first version out there, and it gives everybody an ability to understand what's happening. So one of the things that you need to do on the other side of that equation is to take a look at data management in general and say, what of these things are going to be important for our organizations and what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need to have both within our group and across organizations in order to come up with this? On the other side of that, we want to balance out the DIMBOK with the DMM. And the DMM is a structure that Carnegie Mellon has put forth, giving us the ability, as I showed you before, to measure how well we're doing in each of those areas and to give us a nice pathway of getting better about it. So these are the two infrastructure pieces that we'd like you to concentrate on at the same time you're delivering specific, tangible, dollar-oriented results in order to come up with the balanced equation that's there. So I'm going to finish out here as we head towards the Q&A, and I'm going to walk you through the framework one more time. Again, our data strategy framework starts out by understanding the business needs, understanding the organizational mission, the strategy and objectives, the organizational structures that are going to be helpful, and the performance measures that you're going to use in that organization. I worked with one organization at one point where they had over 1,400 individual performance measures. That's a lot to manage, but that's okay. If it works for the organization, then we need to track them. Most organizations take those business needs as a whole and try to go directly to a solution. Again, this is wrong. Trying to put that solution in place without understanding the organization's current state. And again, I don't just mean the state of IT or the state of data management practices in there. It's the whole state of the organization. What is their organizational readiness? Are they able to manage and understand business process architecture management, data management practices? Do they have a good handle on what data assets they have and what technology assets that they have and are they able to use them? We have both of those capabilities. Both of them are necessary. Neither one is sufficient. Then and only then does it make sense to make our strategic data imperatives. What sort of a vision are we going to come up with for these round one imperatives? Again, absolutely key to making everybody understand these are the first. There will be second, third, fourth iterations as you go through. I'd recommend annual 
cycles on this. However, some organizations make you report more quickly on this. Which leads us to one final quick point on all of this. A strategic data imperative is that you cannot manage data as a project. Data has no beginning and no end and consequently cannot be managed as a project. Instead, it must be managed as a program. If you have trouble figuring out the differences or articulating the two, Google program versus project on the web and you will absolutely find lots of examples on how to do that. Once you understand your first set of data imperatives, things that you can do that will impact the things that the people who run your organization need in order to do this. Again, in the, chart, uh, the logistics company example there, it was balancing out their capacity there. Then and only then does it make sense to make a roadmap, and that roadmap needs to be a balance between business value that you're delivering on a regular basis, because no matter what you do, sooner or later somebody's going to turn around and say, well, that was great, but what have you done for me lately? And balancing that capability between new capabilities. So again, part of your effort is delivering business value. Part of your effort is delivering the new capabilities to the organization so that it will be able to do this in the future. If you get a data strategy then, what we'd like to do is help everybody to understand the importance of data. So don't take that data strategy just within the organization. Try to make that an explicit component of the organizational strategy. And again, remember, do not subordinate it to the IT strategy. It cannot succeed in an IT project mindset. It will create then a vision for the entire organization that everybody can identify with, identifying specific strategic imperatives which show people how it will help them to increase their ability to execute strategy. It defines the measures, and I say defines, it really formalizes the measures and benefits that are there uh, to tell them what the future is going to look like. Again, imagine a world where people didn't check out of the hospital and check back in the next day if you're in healthcare. Uh, and it then specifically describes the data management improvements that are needed. Finally, then we need to understand when it can happen, gives the outline of the approach, gives us estimated levels of investment that are required in order to do this. So we are just about at the top of the hour, and I will turn it back over to Britt so we can start to run our way through some questions. Hope that's helpful. All right. Uh, now it's time for a question and answer round. Uh, it's time for you guys to ask the questions. So just click on the Q&A window feature at the top of your screen, and you should be able to submit your questions through that window. Uh, currently, we have a few questions in the queue, so I'll get right to them and pass them on to Peter here. Uh, the first question is, how does the strategy flow from business architecture capabilities and then business process management? Excellent question. So if we go back to our overall framework, and let me get to the very top here. We're looking at this from a data-centric perspective and saying that we can't do things without understanding the holistic perspective on all of this. Uh, and the business process architecture is going to be one of those perspectives. So when we talk about the business mission and how the organization succeeds uh, in order to do this, okay, let's go back to another slide as well. It is absolutely critical that this be done in context. So again, as we're analyzing the business here and trying to figure out how it actually does what it does, what the company does, why it exists, and how the company does it are the things that define the business needs. Some of those business needs are going to be process-oriented. Some of those business needs are going to be data-oriented. If we understand one without understanding the other, we only understand half of the picture. So this is why we talk about it here in the current state. As I mentioned a couple times in the presentation, doing the business needs without understanding the current state of the organization leads an awful lot to people get buying into big, expensive hardware and software solutions, but that they don't actually work in the organization. Uh, again, I, I, that I actually heard people saying, I didn't know where else to stick the data, so I stuck it in the MDM. Uh, it, you can clearly see that this organization did not get what they were supposed to out of implementing a master data management strategy as one of their strategic data imperative commit, uh, imperatives uh, on the roadmap delivering to whatever they were resulting in their business needs. I think I answered that one, Britt. Just finishing capturing real quick. Uh, the next question that I have was actually a, a couple parts to it. Uh, 
The first question was, and actually you have to bear with me because I'll have to put the two together. Uh, from the DMM, a data management strategy is one of six disciplines. It, is there an overarching? And then uh, the next, she kind of redacted and said, oops, uh, data strategy, that includes all six, or should they have an independent strategy? Yeah, so good question. Let's get to the DMM and just make sure everybody else can track with us uh, on this. Uh, where is it? There we go. So what you're seeing here on the DMM is that there's no point in having governance. There's no point in doing architecture pieces. There's no point in doing data operations. And there's no point in attempting to improve the quality of the data in the organization if you don't have some guidance that says what is it that's going to pull it all together. So the data management strategy is key in the DMM structure to being one of the five components that we put in there. We also put in there additional support practices from the organization. I had that on a different slide. Uh, maybe I can pull that one up to take a look at it as well. But the idea is that if you don't understand how that works organizationally, you will not be able to, uh, in fact, help people understand why certain things have to be done first, second, third, fourth. The strategy is all about what's important. Remember back to the Porter quote that I had up there earlier. Strategy is oftentimes deciding what to do and what not to do, and what things you should do differently from other organizations who are doing the same thing. For example, now that uh, Amazon actually has concrete and mortar implementations, right, uh, places where they have to go where there's concrete and mortar, uh, they're not actually inviting customers into most of those places. They're really focused on a one-way, we'll pick it online and deliver it to you, as opposed to going shopping. Going shopping nowadays means going for your iPad. Uh, so uh, again, if I understand your question correctly, you're looking at these six processes, the supporting processes and the five integrated data management practice areas that we have, and saying strategy is an important component of those. It's not subordinate or overarching to them, it's an integrated piece because data management strategy tells us what should be governed, quality then says which pieces are important to the organization achieving its objective, what platform and platforms can be evaluated as more or less supportive of the organizational mission uh, in order to do that. And finally, the data operations, the lifecycle management says we can actually do better or worse uh, in order to do this. Most organizational data, by the way, 80% of it is rot, which means that it's redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And that's another thing that you may need to have as a strategy is to say we've actually had many organizations that will hire us to come in and improve their data quality. And we'll say, which ones? And they'll say, well, no, all of it. And I say, well, you know, that's a guaranteed employment contract for life. We'd love to work with you on that, but it wouldn't be giving you business value as a result. So consequently, let's concentrate on the ones that are really important to you, the ones that make a difference in terms of your ability. Read the question for me one more time, Britt. Let me make sure I've got all of the, the, the pieces. That was a fairly nuanced piece. From the DMM, data management strategy is one of six disciplines. Is there overarching? And then there was a redaction, uh, oops, uh, data strategy. Uh, that includes all six, or should they have an independent strategy? Yeah, so the only independent piece in this model here is the external organizational strategy. It comes down, uh, actually give me a second, I think I can show you another version of the same thing. We will include this in the slides too, Britt. Um, let's see, you guys are looking at works in progress here, but hey, what the heck, right? Um, so here you can see a little better articulation of how that works out. The external variable that comes in, data management practices and the infrastructure, organizational strategy, however, is at the top. And you can see how it works its way through, eventually devolving at the bottom set to uh, business value. They call this my pachinko model because you drop it in, it goes bing, 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 and all the way through and tries to, to come up with it. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. We'll certainly give you guys a copy of this as well uh, in order to uh, set it part of the package on that. Then I have a few more here, and actually a couple just rolled in. So uh, keep them coming. Uh, is data governance a component of data strategy, or is the data strategy governed by data governance? So a great question. Let me get back to the presentation here. 
So the answer is they are both components on this, but you're not likely to be doing data strategy all the time and continuously. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. On the other hand, if you're just sitting around at a data governance meeting and wondering why the heck you're at that meeting, somebody's clearly not doing things uh, the way we want them to be done. So data strategy is a component of the DMM, but you're not going to revise your data strategy all the time. In fact, how often are you going to revise your data strategy? Only as often as it needs to be revised given how the data management group is providing value to the organization as a whole. Again, let's just take a, an example of a CRM, customer relationship management example. If a customer relationship management improvement is key to an organization's success and the data management strategy says buy package X and you buy package X and put it in and it doesn't give you the results that you want, then clearly you're going to have to revise your data management strategy and say, hmm, maybe we selected the wrong CRM package or maybe we're taking the wrong approach to our CRM. I'm oversimplifying and not giving you guys any context on this, but hopefully that makes sense. So the strategy may need to be revised. Maybe the organization, let's take the opposite direction. Let's say the organization says, well, we can get everything we need to from our existing customer data by integrating it internally and making our own CRM system. So the governance would then be focused on making that data higher priority perhaps than other types of data or other types of data initiatives within the organization. As you do that, you want to evaluate and say, are we in fact giving better information about our customers to the people who service our customers? If the answer is no, then we probably are not working correctly. We need to go back and revise our data management strategy. By the way, never a good idea to revise your data management strategy unless you go back to the organization and say, oh, by the way, are we still operating under the same organizational strategy or do we expect to be in the next couple of years? Uh, my mother worked in the purchasing agency of a, a large company for a while, and, and she would say she always knew when they were going to change the strategy because they'd tell her to stop ordering any more um, uh, paper, uh, any more uh, letterhead, stationery, and things like that, and because uh, they knew there was a new, you know, slogan and all sorts of other things coming along uh, in order to do that, and that would really give her a problem. She'd call me, "You want some insider information?" Uh, Anyway, I think I answered the question, governance is an integrated component and strategy should be done periodically, but by golly, they both got to be done because if we don't have one or the other, it makes it hard to figure out where we're going or why we're doing it. Um, okay. The next question is, can you go back to the data-centric strategy slide? IT project-centric data strategies also have the problem of IT project-centric funding. Can you share insights um, slash question, question. tips for moving to a data-centric funding strategy? So, so great question, great insight as well. Yes, this is the real fundamental problem. When we look at this model, this is how the organizations do things. They say, I have some strategy and they have some other strategic components. I certainly don't mean to imply that strategy is always implemented solely by IT projects, but IT projects are always implemented that way. And as the questioner asks correctly, that's where the funding is. So they ask you the question, how long is it going to take you to do a data architecture for that IT project? And the answer is, I can't do a data architecture for that IT project because it operates at a different cadence, a different rhythm, a different set of funding goals. What we have to look at, again, IT projects are in a project method. Data is a program and it has to be funded differently. So your first action as a data strategy may be to enable some portion of the organization's funding to fund you as a program instead of a project. It's like asking you how far are you going to be able to um, drive on this car and saying, by the way, I have a gas tank of one gallon. So no matter how far one gallon takes you, you're going to have to stop and refuel all the time, which means you're going to spend more time refueling than you are actually driving. Uh, and that's going to be a problem. And that's kind of like what we're doing here. So uh, again, great question. Keep this in mind. And, and if you come up with a better articulation, share it with us because these are things, tools for you guys to use. Data is different than IT. Data must proceed. Data must be separated from, and it must be external to. The only way you can justify that. 
Now, you do a little bit of that justification and show that you saved the organization $25 million or brought the organization $25 million a year additional productivity in the chemical company example that I gave you in uh, the third section or the fourth section of this. Um, you won't have trouble getting that funding again. It was interesting. I actually had a business lunch today with a fellow who's working for one of the local banks, and he said, our entire group is focused on that. We've been told to demonstrate uh, next year that the investment in our group will produce a tenfold improvement in the operations. In other words, if our group's costing a million dollars, they want us to show $10 million worth of savings next year uh, in order to do that. And I said, well, or else what happens? He said, or else we all get fired. Ooh, boy, that's a tough one. Great question. Um, next question is a two-parter. Uh, somewhere around slide 71, there was the idea that the data strategy based on business strategy produces information product. Uh, please define and provide examples of what you call an information product. Sure, let me go back actually to here before I go to slide 71. The idea here is that only a data management program can produce products that are recognized by the organization as being useful. And only the ability to have those products can actually uh, mean that the IT project world will look to you for some particular pieces. So. Hang on, I switched too far. Sorry, hang on. I'm going to go back there. Um, so the idea is within this model of operating, what we're really looking for is the ability to programmatically develop things at the data and information layer that proceed are external to and are separate from IT projects, and that those data projects can be then used by IT projects to improve things. Now, this is another area. I haven't gone into this much today, um, but those of you that have heard me speak know that I, I claim to have uh, investigated many more than 100 IT failures over the years, and in 100% of the cases, data has been the root cause. So improving your data will actually help your IT systems as well uh, in terms of the implementation that goes in there. <clears throat> now, the products should be used in the following fashion then. We start out with the idea that the data management program is nascent and it's going to be used on an individual project. And that's what I was showing on this series of slides here where they get some particular pieces. Now, the product here, which is what the, the questioner was asking, what is it? Well, this is our first definition of person in the organization. And again, let's presume you're following a fairly worn path like implementing a master data management solution. Uh, either with technology or simply as a discipline. By the way, MDM is defined by Gartner as a strategy, not an actual technology. So uh, they, we share views on that. This end result here might implement uh, the first version of person on the first IT project, but then we put that person back and that person then goes back in and extends the next version of that to be the second version of person. Uh, hopefully it doesn't require major changes, only some minor pieces, because if you do a good job architecting in the first place, you don't have real problems with that. Uh, again, that depends on having the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities and right set of people in order to do this. And that the third version of it will become increasingly valuable and meet more and more organizational needs uh, as far as going over all of that. So again, the idea is here within that process Try to figure out how you can get the organization to understand the value of having a common definition of all pieces. By the way, if you want to take that level up to a higher level of abstraction, this is a dangerous place to get into. Um, but uh, Len Silverstein and I have had many, many discussions about abstracting persons up to parties. And the problem is if you sit around talking about parties, they don't think you're actually doing any work. Uh, but parties are, are the next level of abstraction up since then. So if you go up to the party level of abstraction, there's probably another word that you can use for it instead of party, um, but it is, uh, it is something that the organization can make use of. So that way, if a person becomes an employee, an employee then does business with the organization and buys things from it, you can handle all those with the same data structure, which at the moment most organizations throw up their hands and go, oh my, I just give up. Great question. Hopefully I answered it. If not, 
just get some clarification on it. Okay. Um, the next question is, and I, I have one, two, I have four more as of now, and there may be a few coming up. Oh, we're going to make sure to do over time today. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. We'll, we'll try to go through a little quicker. Uh, how valuable is the CMMI DMM model for determining the DMM, and is it something that can be done by the organization without hiring a vendor? And he's uh, wondering if there's a way to bypass the uh, model license for scoring their data maturity. I don't think you can get away with bypassing the model license for their maturity, but you can certainly do a self-assessment in this. Again, the five areas are, and we encourage organizations to do this themselves. Um, yes, eventually if you decide you need some professional guidance, it makes sense to go out, but you can certainly do an awful lot of this yourself. Uh, apologies, Melanie, if you're listening in, but uh, I know that you'd rather have people thinking about it than do it. Melanie, uh, Mecca and I, as I mentioned, are going to do a uh, full talk on this in May. Uh, but the idea here is that if you look and say how we're managing our data as an asset coherently across the organization, uh, are we looking at fit for purpose for our most important data items? Are we growing a set of individuals who know how to manage data assets as a profession, understand how to fit architectural uh, perspectives into our business needs and make sure data operations match. Yes, you can do that, and the way you do it is by matching them up on this particular scale. So I'm not going to build it for you here, but you remember that was the one through five scale. You can look at that internally and perform your own self-assessment, and that is a great place for you to start. I would be clear and say, you know, this doesn't mean that this is the way it is, the organization, but this is the best that, you know, our judgment gives it. Uh, there's actually a paper, a reference paper out there uh, that I wrote back in 2007 where we took about a couple hundred organizations that had done this themselves and given their own ratings to this. Uh, and the paper was accepted for academic publication, so uh, clearly they felt it was uh, worthwhile in this case. And you can show the organization and say, look, you know, we're ones in these areas and twos in these areas, and we ought to get better at the ones before we take the twos and try to make them into threes. So it's a great question. Hopefully that answered it for you. Short answer is yes, but I want to make sure that you get the full detail on it. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, can you explain the linkage or correlation between the slices of the Dembach wheel and the CMMI Pentagon? Well, that's a great question, and the short answer is we're working on making it more formalized. Both of these two pieces were done by separate organizations. Um, and uh, uh, again, DEMA did this one. So this is the slices, if you will, the pizza pie with the slices, and then how we get the slices to work within this context here. The chart I showed you a little while ago that we'll include in here is sort of a first attempt to try and get that into place, but uh, the actual formalization of it has not been completed, and it's one of those actions in progress. Um, if you'd like to help out with that process, we are both, I think, volunteer, largely volunteer organizations, uh, so we depend on the good uh, efforts of, of uh, y'all in the uh, concerned and caring public to help out. So uh, send me your name and address if you'd like to volunteer for it. Otherwise, wait a little bit and we will absolutely get it done because it is, as the questioner asks, a very necessary piece to do. Okay. Um, what is the role of a metadata repository in a data architecture strategy? Name the top three things to focus on in implementing a metadata repository. Gee, we're going to do a topic on metadata coming up somewhere soon. Um, I don't know which one's probably on that piece of paper over there. Uh, and the so top three things three, from a data strategy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what's it? So, uh, the importance of MDM is it? No, that's actually master data management. Oh, sorry, that's one of those synonym things. I know. I, hear. I, I had uh, a case of. Uh, oh, metadata strategy. That's not till August. If you need more, give us. Give you a preview on that. Okay. okay. Dyslexia there. <laughs> <laughs> so, top three things. Great question. This would be like an exam question for somebody. Um, if you're looking at metadata from a strategy perspective, first thing I would be storing in the metadata repository is elements of the strategy. So this is something that the vendors haven't done all that much work with, but it's pretty easy to implement. Uh, let's just presume that, again, I'll go back to my CRM, customer relationship management example. If CRM is high on the priority, I would be coding things in the metadata repository and saying these are related to CRM or they're not. Uh, you could actually grade them as a one, two, or three, real important, somewhat important, or eh, we're going to ignore that for this year kind of a thing. 
So it's another piece of metadata that lets you know whether you're looking at something that is data related uh, is actually important in there. Now that's number one. Number two, I think I would do actually whether the thing is of known quality. Now this is something that's very scary to organizations. Remember I gave you that wonderful piece of consulting advice where you can say, at no point in the future will there ever be less data than there is right now. Well, similarly, you can also say to most organizations, do you know that we can say right now all of our data is of unknown quality? Man, that'll get management's attention in a second. If they don't have any idea of that, if all of our data is of unknown quality, it's going to scare the you-know-what off of them. So in your metadata repository, if you have even an inkling of whether that data is of good or bad or really sucky quality, um, that's another piece that I would put on there as well. Finally, the other thing that I would add to that is something that most chief data officers are charged with as well, which is the idea that um, the um, most organizations when they're trying to do this are told to start by going off and doing a data inventory. And if they do a data asset inventory, uh, they will be, uh, uh, you know, completing their first role as a chief data officer. Now, I think that's an absolutely preposterous solution because, first of all, when they tell you to go off and do the data asset inventory, they ask the next question, how long is that going to take you to do? And I've never known anybody that's actually come up with a data asset complete inventory of everything that's in their system. So three weeks now, three months from now, three years from now, you still may not have the answer to the complete data assets. But if you put on their known and hypothesized assets into your metadata repository, you can incorporate them with the quality and uh, priority codes that I gave you before, and that will certainly help you out as well. Uh, that's actually pretty good off the top of my head. I wouldn't bank on any of that advice, but uh, watch for it. It'll certainly be in the next book uh, as we work our way through it. Thanks for a great question. Okay. Uh, I have another one here, and there's a couple that are kind of uh, borderline that we may be able to address really quickly here as time kind of expires. Uh, can data governance be successful without the other pillars of DMM? It's really difficult. I mean, when you see the other pillars, I'm assuming you're talking about the five uh, pieces here. If, uh, what is data governance going to do if it's not going to implement a data strategy, improve your data quality, improve your operations, and make sure that your platform and architecture are harmonized to support your business objectives? I don't see how that could be the case. Um, it, it seems to me that would be doing governance for governance sake, which is busy work, which nobody likes to do. Um, if you look out there on the web, there's a video that somebody did to the song of Hotel California about being in a data governance meeting that was really, really boring. Uh, if you can't find it, let me know and I'll, I'll send you a copy of it. But uh, No, I don't think the answer to that is, is you do not want to do data governance without these other things. It is reasonable to ask what you're doing in a data governance meeting if people don't seem to have a, a purpose. I mean, that's... We're going to have to get you a bigger screen, Brittany. Right now, I see, yeah, the, for some reason, it does, the kerning is a little weird here. Um, there's actually two questions here that are kind of buried in, in this. It's, uh, well, this one I think is kind of fun. What comes first, data strategy or data governance, or is this a chicken and an egg scenario? If you're doing governance without a strategy, you shouldn't be. So I would absolutely put strategy first because your strategy has to be derived, again, from the organizational strategy. If you don't have that, uh, good luck to you on, on anything that you're trying to do. So I would absolutely not put it in a chicken and egg situation and say that if you don't have a data management strategy, a data strategy that is relative to your organizational strategy, um, there's just not much point in doing what you're doing. Okay. And then I have one more really quick one that was also hidden in there. Uh, what advice do you have for improving organizational readiness? Yeah, well, uh, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I would start out by keeping your expectations small. I know that's a terrible thing to say, but Rome wasn't built in a day, 
and changing the way organizations have neglected data for years and years and years isn't going to happen with a new CEO, a new strategy, and new other things. So this organizational readiness chart diagnosis is, is really, this goes to really the heart of everything we do as data professionals, of course. We want to solve problems. So when you have an organizational readiness problem, it's usually not all of these things, but it's usually some subset of them. So use this as a template to, to figure out exactly what's going wrong in your organization, point it out to leadership, and, and see if they can help you to address it. Otherwise, you can similarly point out to them and say, there's not a whole lot of point in putting any more money into this thing if we don't know which direction we're going, right? Again, journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, but uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So with that, I guess we're out of time, Brent. I believe so. Uh, let me go through my little end of uh, discussion spiel here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. We hope you have enjoyed it. Thanks again to our sponsor, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Dataversity, and Shannon for hosting us. Once again, you will receive today's material within the next two business days. Our webinar next month will be the importance of MDM on... Which now stands for <laughs> Master, Master Data. There we go. <laughs> Which, uh, details, details. I read it right this time. Yeah. So we're good. Uh, hopefully you will be able to join us for that as well. As always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone, and have an awesome day. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Britton. That wow, that's a huge picture of me. Um, <laughs> thanks as, uh, always to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and taking the time to ask so many great questions. And uh, just to reiterate, thanks to our sponsor, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, who enable us to do all these great webinars for everybody. Hope everyone has a great day.